a master of tactics. The merfolk player gives their creatures synergy on the battlefield merely by casting them. Steady and silent is the deep current. The merfolk player guides the course of gameplay with a deck that combines tempo and aggro swarm. Let the control players know the color blue is no longer the border between us on the color pie. A new age of gameplay has begun. White Splash Merfolk is a highly versatile modern build, allowing for a plethora of customization options. The deck not only is highly synergistic, but also highly flexible. This is not a deck where you have no options for change. The list is not written in stone, but rather fluid, one where you constantly experiment and fine-tune. So why Splash White? The white splash is almost entirely for sideboard options. While the deck runs a bit of mainboard white spells, most notably Path to Exile, the options that it opens up for us in our sideboard are spells and effects that blue just doesn't have access to by itself. With a white splash, the sideboard can now run three Rest in Peace and three Stony Silence, answering any and all graveyard and artifact-based decks. A pair of Leyline of Sanctity is another must a solid answer to probably half the decks we might be up against these days. In addition to all of this, a pair of Ghostly Prison to slow down and disrupt aggro-based opponents is possibly one of my favorite cards in the sideboard, highly underrated in general. The remainder of our sideboard is Three Remand, a counterspell whose drawability is often a time walk, and a pair of Hercules Recall to help against Affinity, which is one of Merfolk's worst matchups. Choke is not a threat. One of the old adages you'll hear as a merfolk player is, if the deck ever started to dominate the format, people would just regularly run choke, and that would be the end of merfolk. This is entirely wrong, and I want to really clearly say that choke isn't a threat to us. Our deck only runs four islands. The rest of the mana base is made up of cards not affected by choke. Two Cavern of Souls so that control players can't counter our merfolk, a playset of Mutavault, and for the white sources, playsets of both Seachrome Coast and Wanderwine Hub, and Two Hollowed Fountain. Overall, this is still a very inexpensive mana base as far as modern is concerned. No fetch lands needed here, but even mono blue merfolk builds don't need to worry about choke. If you are playing mono blue, incorporating cards such as the School at Water's Edge and the Palace in the Cloud clouds are essentially just lands that tap for blue, but aren't basic islands and thus not affected by choke. Integrate that into your mono blue build with a playset of the Wanderwine hubs, and the standard fare of Mutavaults and Cavern of Souls, and choke just isn't a threat whether you play mono blue or splash white. Another reason choke is not something we worry about in Merfolk is the playset of Aether Vials that the deck runs. Nearly all our creatures in this deck are converted mana cost too. The rest, with one exception, our mana cost of three. So Aether Vial turns into major acceleration in terms of getting our fish onto the battlefield. But there's more to Aether Vial than that. Aether Vial places a creature into play as an activated ability. You do not actually cast the creature that it puts into play, and thus counter spells can't stop that creature from coming into play. Also, since Aether Vial can be used at any time, you can tap it to put a creature into play during your opponent's turn, even during combat. Flashing in a creature is either a surprise blocker, or as a surprise boost to the power and toughness of the other creatures we have in play, is one of this deck's most reliable combat tricks. While choke may not be a problem for us, merfolk players can choke out our opponent's mana by drowning them in islands, using what is probably the best card in this deck. Spreading Seas. Most players view Spreading Seas simply in relation to allowing our island-walking merfolk to attack without being blocked. While this is obviously an important part of the spell, it has a great deal of versatility. Spreading Seas can disrupt so much of our opponent's land-based strategies, from turning their Urza's Tower into a basic island, or doing the same to their Eye of Ugin or Celestial Colonnade, or just by strategically getting rid of a greedy mana base's single source of a color. Nothing feels better than casting Spreading Seas turn two on their one black or red source, and then seeing them drown without another source of that color for the next several turns. Oh, and we also draw a card off of it. 
best spell ever. The heart of this deck is, of course, the extreme synergy of our Merfolk, namely the 15 to 16 Merfolk Lords we run. 15 to 16 Lords? That's right, because in addition to the functionally identical Lord of Atlantis and Master of Waves, we also run three to four Phantasmal Images, giving us what is essentially additional copies. Phantasmal Image is also a very versatile spell, as we can use it not only to copy our creatures, but also anything special and powerful of our opponents as well. The remaining playset of Lords are the Four Marrow Regiri, a card that, when we cast a Merfolk spell, allows us to tap or untap a target permanent. Untap Aether Vial to bring yet another creature into play, or if you have two Regiri in play, each time you cast something like a Lord of Atlantis, you can just untap the two islands you tapped to cast it, and then essentially empty out your hand of all your two drops. Or just use the Regiri to lock down our opponent's creatures. One of the best gifts to Merfolk players in recent years isn't the Master of Waves. A card I have never been very crazy about, and which is starting to fall out of favor with a lot of Merfolk players. This build runs two main board and that's it. No, the best gift to Merfolk players recently has been the printing of Harbinger of the Tides, a two-drop Merfolk that will return a tapped creature of our opponents to their hand, and that can be flashed in for a few extra mana. When one of our opponent's creatures isn't tapped, if a Marrow Regiri is in play, we can cast Harbinger, tap their creature in response, then send it back to their their hand when Harbinger resolves. And of course, a playset of Silvergill Adept, which give us a merfolk body and card draw, another tempo staple of our deck. By now, many modern merfolk players are asking the question, why don't you run a playset of Curse Catchers? I have never been a fan of Curse Catchers because their effectiveness is often only early game. To me, this is often a 1-1 one, one for 1 if drawn late or even mid-game, as its 1 mana fee to counter their instant or sorcery is often easily paid. The only time this is effective is early game, ideally as your turn one drop, and at best this simply delays your opponent's thought seize by one turn. I've never been a fan of them and I don't run them, but again, feel free to put a playset in here. Instead, I favor mainboarding both Kira, the Great Glass Spinner, and Spellskites. These cards individually provide great protection for your creatures with Kira countering, the first spell that targets each of your creatures each turn, and spell Skite, of course, being available to redirect things like Lightning Bolt to itself. And wow, some games you get both Kira and a Spell Skite in play, and your creatures are essentially untouchable. After all, the best way to play against Merfolk is to pick off the individual pieces one by one, especially early game before that aggro has a chance to swarm. Protecting your creatures with Spell Skites and Kira will often disrupt your opponent's removal and other answers enough to get the whole school of your fish into play. We didn't just splash white for our sideboard. Having access to white mana means the incredible control of three path to exile, perfect for what has now become a much more creature heavy modern meta. I also like to run a single vapor snag main board. There's the harbingers for most situations when we want to bounce a creature, but snag is never something you are sad to see in hand. With the white splash, the options are endless. Merfolk is known for being a solid staple of the competitive scene, always present and putting up a hard fight, but never quite being able to break through into total domination of the format. While usually a very good budget build, prices have recently risen like the tide, so hopefully Merfolk reprints in an Eternal Master set will return them back down again. I hope very much this video has been of some help to you. Remember that this video, as with all my videos, is made possible by the generous support of our patrons over at Patreon where donations as little as $1 a month are the only thing that keeps this channel running. So thank you.